Father God, you know that we don't even come close to you in our thoughts. The things that we think about, the directions that we head, but we thank you for using our activities for your greater purpose. And we pray that we will continue to hear you, that we will continue to move in your direction under Pastor John. We believe that you have sent him and we believe that you have a direction for us through him. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I know we're all excited. I'm pumped up. I mean, I feel like this is like right before a football game. We're supposed to all be jumping around, you know, and I came down the aisle over there. There was a, a bunch of men right there, and I really just wanted to bump chest, you know, like right, right before the football game. That's what we do, and even the coaches do it. So, um, I don't know if we'll ever get there, but maybe one day we will. I'm excited about uh, God bringing Pastor John here. I'm excited that we went through um, a shepherd in Pastor Ray that I consider a legacy. Uh, I'm really excited about that. I'm excited that God gave us five interim pastors that love him and that led us, and thank you so much for that. And I'm really excited that Pastor John uh, felt that God was calling him to us. So thank you, Lord. I was also excited a couple weeks ago when uh, Pastor John opened up uh, his sermon with Isaiah 55, 10, and 11. And the reason why was because I was preparing this sermon uh, back then, and, and this sermon is thrusting from Isaiah 55, 8, and 9. So when he shared from Isaiah 55, 10, and 11, I was like, yeah, we're on. So thank you, Lord, for that. So let's go ahead and reread that, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. Uh, remember the first part of Isaiah, uh, up to about 39 and 40, it's primarily judgment. And then as it goes on, God talks about deliverance. God is going to deliver the uh, Israelites from the Assyrians. God is going to heal King Hezekiah from his sickness. And then the Bible goes on, Isaiah starts to speak of the deliverer. And especially in Isaiah 53, he talks about the suffering servant, the Messiah, and we know him to be Jesus. In chapter 55, this is what I call the invitation chapter, where God says, come to me, listen to me, seek me. And then he says this in verses 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. See, deliverance back then was primarily associated with God delivering them from their enemies and God delivering them from illness. However, God is saying here in these verses, that what I'm about to deliver you from is bigger than you can ever imagine. Yeah, I delivered you from the Assyrians and from more of your enemies. I healed you from your sickness. But what I'm about to do in your lives is bigger, bigger than you could ever imagine. And something inside of me is just saying that, Makakilo, I'm about to do something bigger than you can ever imagine. Let's reread this verse. I want you to reread it to yourself. And I want you to personalize this verse as though God was saying it to you. I'm going to read it out loud, but you guys read it to yourself and just add in your name here and there. Okay? Go ahead, read it. Cyril, my thoughts are not your thoughts, Cyril. Neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, Cyril, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than yours. The bottom line here is that God 
is bigger than we can ever imagine. And throughout this sermon, you're going to hear that over and over. And that is pretty much the thrust of where we're going. Now let's turn to Matthew 26. Matthew chapter 26. And where I'm going to go with this is I'm going to illustrate from the Bible a handful of uh, passages in Matthew 26 where the people who, who were around Jesus at this time did not have God's thoughts. They did not have God's thoughts. Okay? Let's start from verse 1 and 2. It says, When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Jesus here tells us, gives us the executive summary of what's going to happen. The Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Okay, so you would figure, everybody knows this. This is what's going to happen. Everybody's in the zone. We're all on one team. We're all going to go right there. Son of Man's going to be handed over. Verse 3. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest whose name was Caiaphas, and they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. Okay, these are the adversaries of Jesus. They feel as though they were planning against Jesus. God, well, not planning against God, against Jesus. And they did it even to think about some sly way they were going to pull it off. They planned not to do it during a feast. This is what we call in today's world risk mitigation. Businesses do it all the time. What's the risk if we do it during the feast? There might be a riot. Okay, what's the preventive measure? Okay, we're not going to do it during the feast because there might be a riot. Okay, that's heavy duty planning. Now, if these people, that these adversaries, the chief priests and the elders, if they knew God's thoughts, they would have did one of two things. If they were really for God, and they knew God's thoughts of redemption for man, they would have become Jesus' disciples. If they knew God's thoughts, and they were really for Satan, they would have kept Jesus alive. They did neither. Why? Because they did not have God's thoughts. Verse 6. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When, Jesus, when the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. The perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Now, these disciples, these are the guys who hung around God. They hung around Jesus. You would have figured if anybody had God's thoughts, it would have been them. They had no clue that this woman was going to come in here and prepare Jesus for burial. I'm not even sure, and we can't speculate, whether or not the woman even knew that she was doing that. She might have been anointing Jesus for another reason of her own, but God's greater plan was anoint Jesus for burial. This could have been much easier. Jesus gave the executive summary. The Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. The disciples could have said, okay, Lord, we understand what's going to happen. Here's what we're going to do. Let's go ahead and get someone in here to uh, anoint you, prepare you for burial. Uh, then we'll prepare you. Let us know when you're ready. We'll let the chief priests and the elders uh, take you at that time. We'll go get your cross ready. In fact, what tomb would you like to arise from? 